here we go. Welcome to our AI Playbook for Research, CRO, and Experimentation. This live session today marks the launch of a long-awaited AI Playbook. My name is Tiffany Fortune, Head of Sales at Convert, and I have the pleasure of moderating this session. I'm going to take a moment to introduce our speakers today, starting with Marcella Sullivan. For the past four years, Marcella has been conducting user research and site audits for clients as well as helping companies get the most out of their presence at conferences. Marcella is also a business psychologist currently conducting a study looking at gender stereotypes in advertising. Alongside that, she does market and white paper research for clients looking to better communicate the value of experimentation. In her spare time, I can't believe she has spare time. In her spare time, she loves to bake and arrange flowers, but finds a way to make an experiment out of those hobbies too. Thank you for being here, Marcella. Iqbal Ali, for more than 12 years, Iqbal has served as a co-pilot to product teams assisting with technical implementation, process training, or as a one-man experimentation program. He is the author of comics and graphic novels and has ongoing CRO tell series that explores his perspective of the world of experimentation. As a developer, he's built automation on AI-based tools, including a text mining AI app that quantifies user feedback and reviews, allowing market and product teams to talk to the voice of the customer. Thanks, Iqbal, for being here. Johan von Tonder. He has been in the CRO trenches for 15 years, now CEO of the leading agency, AWA Digital, karate instructor, pretty cool, venomous snake handler, pretty dangerous, and a bad drummer. So thank you for being here. Last but not least, Craig Sullivan. Craig has been blending UX analytics, AV testing, voice of customer and conversion optimization techniques for over 18 years. He has also been building teams, launching products, and hacking the growth of websites of companies like Google, Love Film, Lego, John Lewis, eBay, BFT, and more. By teaching teams and companies to build and measure products differently, he helps unlock the hidden value and growth in every product. Using these approaches, his clients have found over $2 billion in incremental annual revenue in the last five years. Craig lives in Blackheath, London, with an entourage of three pug dogs. Love to be able to see them, but three pug dogs. He likes to relax growing organic vegetables, doing the odd spot of DJing badly, <clears throat> and reading hard-boiled crime fiction. Thank you all. I'm so excited to get started. Part of the conversation today is not just to hear us speak, but we also want to hear your questions. We want you to share your thoughts and we want to discover together how to leverage AI to do the same work that we do today, but do it better and faster. We're gonna go ahead and just get started. So team, my first question today to really kind of get us diving deep into this conversation is really for the entire group. We wanna know where should people get started? Does this require previous experience? And what really makes this different from a prompting guide. Let me let me kick that one off. Um, I think the, the easiest answer for this is to say that people just need to start actually using tools in their daily life because most of the, the knowledge and wisdom that we have gained has been from repeated application of tasks, right? And figuring out over a period of time how to get our tasks done because you know people will often go and try you use a tool oh i had this chainsaw right but it like kicked on me i'm not using the chainsaw anymore and then if you go and watch a youtube video you're like oh i see i was using the chainsaw wrong so it's not a problem with the chainsaw it's just the way i'm handling the chainsaw and this is a common thing that trying to get started means sometimes people give up right before they have put in 
the amount of effort. It's like, oh, the skateboarding thing, it really hurts when you fall off. But that's the whole point of it. You get on it, you fall off, and you get better at skateboarding. You still fall off, right? But it, it, your experience is building. So you just get on it to get started and start actually using it with your real work day to day. And no, it doesn't require previous experience. Ekbal can mention this about his workshops, but um, there are people with no experience at all of using GPT who took to it absolutely fine. We're like, oh, this really helps tighten up my thinking and uh, get better ideas. And, you know, it's really helping me, you know, and that sort of thing's important to us so it doesn't require previous experience you shouldn't be scared of it and what kind of makes this different from a prompting guide is that most of those are very superficial and they don't really show you how to do tasks they're like oh here's a really cool prompt like if you say you're a user researcher it'll do this and a lot of that stuff the people haven't applied it practically and tried to actually use it to do task work so it's just illusory right and normally all these things kind of lead to a paid course somewhere that you can get um, but they're not actually teaching you how to do critical thinking with AI and that's the big difference with our stuff and also I just that sorry go ahead, Bill. no just a really quick point uh, just to add to that uh, basically the whole like with new tools there's obviously new UX and stuff you need to learn uh, but the core thing with um, with chat GPT, the reason why it's so kind of easy to get into is that it's it just starts with a conversation. So uh, I think just people should just start, you know, having conversations with it and learning what you can do, what you can't do and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say exactly that. It is, I, I think people try to overcomplicate it and they try to do fancy stuff with uh, GPT. And really all it is, if you haven't played with it yet, go on to GPT, chat GPT, the free version, and just start chatting to it. And I think a, a, a good first attempt is just to kind of chat with it about your day or what you're trying to get done, an email you're trying to write, maybe paste some stuff into it and ask it for an interpretation. This is actually after two years of fairly advanced use of GPT and LLMs in general. This is my... Um, the, the way I use GPT and other LLMs most commonly, my most common use case is just talking through stuff and using it as a thought partner. So that's where I would start. I think also that what differentiates this from a prompting guide is the way the playbooks are written, make it very easy for people to see how this can be integrated into workflows they already have. So rather than having to do that working out for themselves, we talk through the process and you can easily refer to it as a reference guide. You need to do X piece of your workflow process. Oh, I'll go and look at the playbook to give me an idea about how I could integrate that. So it's more than just a set of prompts. It's something that closely mirrors what you do day to day and how you can get assistance with that. But the okay, lot, lot, last comment sure. from me, I think it also the playbook serves a, a, purp com a important purpose of debunking the myth that this doesn't work. That is thoroughly debunked. Here are uh, four people who have used it. We've peer reviewed each other's um, playbooks. This works. And the other thing I'll say is use it as inspiration. You know, mm -hmm. even if you don't use the actual recipes in the book, it'll yeah. give you ideas about what you might be able to do in your workflow. And, and that is a great point because the playbooks are not there to say, this is how you need to do the rest of work with AI supporting you for the rest of your life. The playbooks are there for a reason, which is to get you doing stuff so that you learn then how to use it, right? This is like a cookery book. If you go through all the recipes in this book, by the end of it, you'll become a pretty good scratch cook. Then you can make your own recipes and your own adventures. So the book is an introduction to critical thinking about interfacing your head with AI in practical ways. So we, do, we don't want people to end up using just our playbooks or we want them to use them as a springboard to learn how to do their own stuff and think about it themselves in a productive way. I love that using it as a springboard. Um, one of the things I think about is you, you know, you can't break it and it's trial and error, right? But 
you guys are believers and I'm feeling it. I'm a believer with you. But when did the penny drop for each of you that AI was going to change the way we work? I'm old enough to remember the days when the internet just became a thing. I'd just come out of university and there were these headlines. This is a fad. People are never going to buy online. People buy from people and all this stuff. And we saw how that played out. And I had that same feeling when I first tasted GPT-2. This is going back before chat GPT. And I, I can't even remember exactly what prompted me to, uh, excuse the pun, to, to try it for the first time. I think it was the discussion on Twitter. I, I noticed that for the first time, that the people on Twitter who were talking about this were not the Twitter bros hyping up NFTs and crypto. These were serious people with serious gravitas. Were, and, and so I, I, I looked into it and I remember the, the experience in my brain. It was unbelievable. I, I don't think I've had an experience like that before. You know, that blown away experience of this, this is going to change the world. Um, and I've had that feeling, that that mental uh, conclusion several times since since then. I still have it all the time. Two things. This is not going to work. This can't work. And then oh, it actually worked. Um, uh, Iqbal should talk about his summarization journey, but the penny dropped for me when we'd been hand encoding data sets, right? So you're taking textual customer review data, you're going through and using a methodology to encode all of that text into topics and then clustering those into themes and basically identifying the taxonomy in a large blob of text. And we were running manual comparisons against GPT and getting really weird results, but eventually figured out how to sort out that uh, uh, quant data extraction. And the moment when I saw we were getting a 95% match against a human manual encoding job that I'd taken great care over, that was the moment I thought, this is really good because two of the results in here we would normally clean out with data cleaning because they don't have any meaningful review data in there and actually by removing those two it got up to 98 and i was thinking now we're cooking on gas i can actually extract from a large body of text all of the customer problems all of the things that make customers happy the entire semantic hierarchy of all of that structure and that's the moment where i thought i've been looking for something like this for years so i can mine customer words and use them in some of my writing to be able to extract meaning from this data used to take days or weeks of work and now it can be done in seconds that's when the penny dropped for me this stuff could be quite useful <laughs> yeah for me it was when i was doing the uh, summarization tool as um, craig mentioned and uh, i always understood the potential of it but um, and also when, when trying with it, with chat GPT, it's kind of like one prompt in, uh, you know, result out. It's a very, very primitive way of, uh, of talking with it. But as soon as I could increase the, my prompt rate with, uh, with GPT using code, using Python and using agentic principles, i.e. kind of chaining and being the decision maker about, you know, okay, I've got this tool. But I've got this problem. I've got this result. I've got this problem with this result. How do I clean this result? I wonder if AI can clean this result. Oh yeah, AI can clean this result. And then what that leads to is a series of chains um, of using both GPT and AI and your own functions to provide the facts and stuff like that. And then you have something that's really customizable and and really quite. Um, um, good with accuracy, uh, whereas if you try to do it by, you know, simple chats, the accuracy isn't quite there. But, you know, so that, that's kind of when the, uh, um, the the penny dropped for me. And also when I was when I was writing the code and needing to update the uh, update my tools because there were updates coming every single day and where I've, something wasn't possible yesterday was now possible. I needed to rewrite the code 
uh, you know, so constant rewriting or just waiting for a week for a problem to solve uh, itself and then actually seeing, oh, yeah, that issue that I had last week with developing this has now been solved. So it's like understanding the rate at which this was progressing is just it was just insane seeing it from uh, from a coding perspective while developing it from it and while everything under your feet is just shuffling and just moving. So, yeah. And and we're realists as well, because as Iqbal and I will both admit, there are some things that GPT can't do, right? If you're running off the back of a vector database, it's not built to go through text and count up the number of times that people moaned about the delivery company and the reviews, for example. What it's built for is actually clustering things that have semantically similar meaning across all of that text, right? And that's the useful bit. You need to build something separate to do that quant data part. But this is all in the book. So we've been honest. We've said, nope, you can't do this with GPD. Nope, you can't do that. Uh, uh, but we have said also, yes, you can do this. Yes, you can do that. Yes, this works really well. Th this will help you. So it's perhaps a, a realistic book in that aspect. Just uh, can't resist uh, making this comment as well, picking up on something Iqbal said there. That rate of evolution you know, every day, that still continues. Every day you wake up and there's something new. And I think the, 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 the thing to, to understand about that is that the tools, the way they are today, are pretty amazing, but it's the worst it's ever going to be. And, you know, if, if you just think about that statement, given what's possible already today, uh, you'd be crazy not not to uh, immerse yourself in this. And this is uh, and just to jump off of that point as well. Uh, something I was speaking to somebody else about this, and um, how I and I said that developing now with AI feels like you're developing a live organism because it behaves differently. It behaves better just by you not coding, just by you just leaving it for a day. It's it's starting to behave uh, differently. So. It's it's yeah it's it's quite insane when you think about it because your code is just like an agent and these LLMs are doing a lot of stuff and these LLMs are evolving at such a rapid pace that you know the output that you get out of your tool yeah. is just improving uh, uh, constantly so yeah in in the time since we started the book idea on the twenty third of January and the time of finishing it right things have changed hugely. Things have improved immensely in that time. The amount of customer data that I can upload. So you can take customer, review data from Trustpilot, you put it into Excel, save it as a PDF, upload it to ChatGPT, and then start having a conversation with it. And it's utterly brilliant because you find such amazing things. And it's also all customer language. That's just one of the examples that we're talking about. But it's it's fun to explore these things. Yeah, also, Johan touched on the amount of tools out there. When I first started using AI, GPT doesn't have the capability to do white paper research in the same way that those specified tools for white paper research can do it. And they're really amazing at it. And it just augments your ability to find new things. But if you use GPT to do something and it can't do it, don't immediately think it can't then be done there probably is a specific tool that someone has built to help you do this thing even better. So go out, look at the tools, try them. They have free trials and you can play around with them. And then you'll find the best thing for your job and what you want to do. Thank you. So, uh, you know, really what I'm thinking about it is like, if there's a way we can just look at augmenting this to our, our thought partners, our practice, how we do work. It's an, again, it's an augmentation. It, it really kind of leads me to the next question, which I can't believe we still have naysayers, but there are naysayers. So how can, how do you think we can get naysayers to start using AI? Um, and can, you know, how can people convince management that AI is worth their investment and good for their company? I saw everybody's hands went up um, at the same time. So go, the go, go, Iqbal, because I think Iqbal well, has the best be explanation of this. No, mine's going to be a very, very quick uh, explanation of this. Uh, have a workshop with AI. Um, it just, uh, and, and I've done it, it kind of yeah, changes people's minds, especially when you design the workshop, 
in order to demonstrate the output, the efficiency savings, all of those kind of benefits that you get from AI. Just do a workshop, uh, ideate with workshop, have have some uh, senior management uh, come in, partake, or just just watch. Uh, and yeah, yeah, and I think that that for me is a is a has is, is something that personally has has kind of proved. And itself. that was that was my answer answer too is to get people to use it with problems in their context and what people were doing uh, product managers and um, uh, C-level execs were getting them to bring along stuff about business and customer problems right upload them all to GPT uh, all the documents bring them all bring them all along and we'll start having a chat with them right but what we'll do is we'll look at problems and try to understand those and then look at potential ideas that, uh, and uh, think solutions that might potentially solve that problem and then turn those into hypotheses right that whole process of walking them mentally through uh, all the way from initial research and thinking not jump into solutions but kind of widen it up this was the thing that cracked it open for people during those workshops that they were seeing this thing was actually helping improve their thinking immensely and that they felt it was a support and they were perfectly happy to have it support them. They didn't feel like, oh, I don't need any of your help, right? It was actually, yeah, this has been really good and really helpful and I, I loved having its input, right? So psychologically, this is a really important thing. You've got to get them to use it. That's it. <laughs> and actually, the key point that Greg mentioned was the relevant problems to them. So basically, uh, the whoever the naysayers are, the senior management, whoever, they have a specific view of what the problem is. Um, having a workshop focused around that problem and what AI can do to solve that problem. I just want to really emphasize that point. Tiffany, I think the something I've seen that I, I I think is a is a red herring and is is kind of to take people down the wrong course is top management, the MBA is asking the question, how can we use this to get rid of people? How can we use this to save some money? That is the wrong question to ask. And it's back to the point that uh, Craig made very eloquently about, you know, what is the problem? And it's also not about, there's this thing called AI. How do we use that? That's also the wrong, the wrong question to ask. The right question is, what are the problems that we're trying to get solved? And how do we use this technology to solve them? I'm glad that you touched on that because that is the greatest fear with naysayers. Is this, is going, is this going to replace my... A workforce team is this going to replace me but again i think like you said before that is not the way to look at this no no ikea have a, a whole um uh you know ethical stance that they've taken on this position where they say we don't want to use ai to replace people what we want to use ai is to create more skilled jobs for people within ikea right that's smart. That's the right way to think about this. So in their call centers, Billy, their AI agent, is fielding about 55% of calls, right? Great. Excellent. Superb, right? So you slash the call center then and lose all the years of experience that those people have gained in supporting and talking customers through problems with IKEA products, right? No. What you do is IKEA trained them up and skilled them up to become video sales assistants. So now they're selling to people over FaceTime and other video channels and giving them a walk round of some of the furniture that they might buy. And that's a billion a year already. And it's projected to be five, I think four or five billion by uh, the end of the decade, right? So they're smart. They're looking at ways to redeploy and move their staff up the skills ladder. It, it doesn't have to be a downward thing. People have a choice here of how they deploy AI. AI. They either use it to make the people at your company smarter and faster than all of your competitors, right? Or you use it to cut costs and be in a race to the bottom with everyone else. This is a productivity game changer and people have to see it as a an upside rather than a negative. And it's humans who make that decision. It's manage, management and company owners that make those decisions, not AI. 
Yeah, I think you touch on an important point there with ethics. We talk about the ethics of CRO a lot. There has to be an ethical approach to the integration of AI as well. And it's really important that we get this understanding out of how to use it ethically, how to augment the people that you have and make their processes better. It is not a replacement. It can't replace the work we do. It can help us to do it better. Great, thank you. So what do you think are the most important things that uh, should be in organization's AI roadmap? We've, we've convinced it, now we, we, we need to plan our AI roadmap. And then how can uh, these playbooks be integrated into the organization? There's a two part question here. Set your staff free, right? Stop saying to them, you can't use open AI with your work, right? Support the people who are already using it, encourage everyone to use it right in their work get the book right and apply some of the playbooks because uh, weeks or months later you'll figure out oh we could use this in our workflow where we normally do this really boring thing that takes days we can use this to do that but you're not going to get to that position of knowledge unless you invest an amount of time in play right so do the play right do the practice get on the skateboard try the tricks right and then when a different problem comes along you'll have the knowledge to be able to solve it and say ah because of those lego components the various bits of the skateboarding i've kind of learned the basics right i can now see how to put them together into a set of tricks and make it look really cool and that's the important thing the the book is lego bricks that if you deploy them and work with them you begin to think ah this is how i make the lego into a bigger structure like igbal was talking about where it's a, it's a data workflow you have a process where ai is part of that process or it's a slack bot that does something for you you need to wire all of this up but you're not going to understand how you can do that unless you learn some of the lego and uh, what I would say is uh, even bef um, I think this is the time to really invest in your data infrastructure infrastructure uh, because because essentially anything you're doing with AI um, and I've seen this mistake played out with so many of these tools where just kind of like like LinkedIn uh, rewrite this with AI it's kind of like just a very simplistic it doesn't have any data backing it up. It's just, and then it just gives really, really bad results and it gives AI a bad name. So uh, the in, investing in the data infrastructure um, now more than ever and the data quality, the data um, integrity and, you know, and that in, in that includes every, all of the knowledge uh, that you have inside the company. Uh, because what that then means is that well-formatted data can then feed into um, AI to give you more specific relevant events. And then and then essentially, yeah, and this, this goes back to what product teams should be doing and how they should be uh, using AI. You shouldn't be using AI in order to implement an AI onto your product. You should always be thinking from your product first and, and kind of not forgetting those, those essential principles you know, what problem our users having and stuff. And then now you've got AI as an additional tool to kind of really solve those problems in a in a different way, more innovative way and stuff like that. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say. I think top management should also include people in all ranks in the decision-making and the policy setting about AI. Uh, there's a study that uh, Ethan Mollick released or tweeted last week where he said that already, you know, the people in your organization, they're already using this. They're just hiding it from you. They're not telling you about this. They're doing it and they're finding all these productivity improvements, but they're keeping it quiet. And I thought about that for a while. And, and I thought, well, one hypothesis would be why people wouldn't communicate that to their management is out of fear for the things that we mentioned earlier. And so I think you should pay, take people into your confidence, not just give them uh, the opportunity to use AI, give them the freedom to experiment with it, but also um, you, you know, be, be upfront with them, um, be honest with them and say what your intentions are and involve them in you know, the broader picture of where we are going with this because nobody knows where this thing is going. Not even Sam Altman who runs OpenAI knows where this thing is going. You and yeah. I don't know, 
my manager doesn't know, your manager doesn't. So, so we need to all figure this out together. Turn it from fear um, and worry about it into something positive. Run an ex a, a hackathon or a prize for coming up with the most innovative way to use GPT or another AI tool with a real business or customer problem. Offer that prize, right? And, and make it a mission to let set people free to try and solve these problems because it's in that interaction of trying to solve the problems that they'll learn how to build an AI-enabled process with people at the heart of it, right? Uh, and for me, this is a people thing. It makes people better. It's like having an additional colleague. It's not about taking away. It's about being additive. Yeah, and Iqbal talked about giving AI a bad name, and that can happen with things like LinkedIn's integration, but it can also happen within an organization as well. If you push this in the wrong way, if you don't teach people how to use it effectively, you're not just wasting time doing that, but you're actually making them more of a naysayer than they were before about what it could do for them. So think about these things carefully before you integrate them, find the right resources to be able to do it and show people the true value of it. Thank you. Now I'm gonna ask some direct questions as we dig deeper into CRO and experimentation. And so this one I'm gonna to address to Iqbal. What can people get out of using AI to do text summarization and analysis? Yeah, well, so something I mentioned just a, um, a little bit earlier was the sorting out the data infrastructure. And one of the most useful uh, um, sort of important data that everybody should have or does have is user feedback, either in the form of reviews or uh, feedback surveys or interviews or whatever. And um, and when it comes to, you know, uh, and we've, we've discussed in length about you know how to chat with AI. That it's a conversation, uh, and but that conversation needs some sort of context uh, to get the most out of that conversation. Uh, the prompt part of the most important part of that prompt is that context and that user um, reviews all the text stuff that you've got from your customers, where there's all these nuggets of information like user user problems and stuff like that. It's all locked away in that. Having that as part of your prompt uh, is a really, really key part of uh, um, part of working with um, working with AI, and also, and and it's because you want to get give AI relevance. Um, so it's not only does it have the data points of billions and billions of other bits of data and stuff, but your relevant data to set the context um, uh, to your relevant sort of area of a company or product or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think, and then just having, uh, being able to do that and being able to categorize, uh, segment, do sentiment analysis uh, and split text in sort of different ways, that just further cements that kind of like, okay, I want to ask this question of my data, what data should I put into AI to get the most relevant answer out? So this is, this is how, important uh the, the text mining is um and yeah in my view so and you guys are welcome to add to that if you want to add to it i don't want to kind of say um, uh, uh, iqbal's actually answered my, my question next but I, I i can give some practical examples of this so let's say someone goes to gpt and thinks okay i'm gonna write a drip feed email right i'm doing a webinar on ai and experimentation right and i'd like a drip feed email campaign like four weeks three weeks one week two days on the day right and i give it all the time frames and i get it to write it and it goes to that vast word lake it has, and then it writes a very lame, middle-of-the-road generic copy, right? And you would look at it and think, ah, oh, I would never use that. That It's terrible, right? But what I did was I uploaded a copy of the book we've written to GPT. And I said, the webinar is going to be about that in the book, right? Now, write me a drip feed email and it wrote wonderful copy because it knows all about the topic now and what's interesting in the topic right same with reviews right um i was w watching my friend michael ogard and he took some positive customer reviews and uploaded them to gpt all the five star reviews 
and then got it to write landing page copy using the value propositions and delight and customer language that were contained in those five star reviews. And I did it the same myself with data sets. You upload that data set. And uh, uh, if you try and write some landing page copy without that context, it's pants. It's really middle of the road. You get what you put in. But if you prime it, you give context and information. You feed the engine of the locomotive with actual real information. Then the quality of the output increases massively. And that's the same for text mining as it is for writing copy. The more background context contextual information you give it, the better the job it does. Um, yeah, just to uh, add, go, go Marcella, go Marcella. I think also with the, the review mining, it's not a new thing to look at reviews. And one of the things I've seen said about using AI to do it is that you're then not immersing yourself in the reviews. And I don't really agree with that because if you use it in the right way and really interact with that data, you are still immersing yourself in the reviews just in a much easier, less time consuming way. So there are some purists that would still say, go and read all of the reviews manually because they see this as you not interacting with it properly. To them, I would say, go and have a try with it because you will still be able to interact with the data set and you will feel immersed. And you can dig into that. If you're at it, you're, uh, when you upload the loads of review data, you, you are talking to the voice of customer Oracle, right? Because you can then ask, ask it questions, right? Um, and, you know, basically it's, a, it's about what you can extract meaningfully from that data. And there's a lot of incredible value in there. And also, just well, sorry to speak about that. But it's also just to just just jump off of Marcella's point there, because uh, uh, this is this is why um, I started developing that tool because basically I wanted to uh, cross check the data that uh, the AI was giving me in a in a series of process. So you have a process for how to crunch the text mining data, how you categorize it, and everything, and then you have a set of uh, check points to check the data um, at each specific point as it's been uh, as it's being processed. Uh, so what that does is it actually gets you closer to the customer reviews, not further away from it, because uh, because being able to summarize it in different ways and being able to see the output in different steps and uh, just gets you to understand much more what customers are saying. And then that way you can also trust where it's giving you. But yeah, sorry, sorry Johan, I interrupted you. Uh, I just spent this weekend analyzing 10,000 um, open text uh, survey responses. Now. There's no way I was going to read through 10,000 rows of data. Absolutely no way. So at best, I may have chosen as a human like a thousand, a sample of thousand, maybe a little bit more if um, if I have extra time. But there is, if I look at the the entire piece of analysis, there is absolutely no way that any human could make sense of all that data those data points and synthesize all of it in the way that a machine was able to do that. Uh, I'm a big fan of open text data and I've, you know, for 15 years I've been doing that. I was quite advanced at it. I would write code in R and Python and, you know, do NLP analysis on it. And um, then I would always feel whenever I did that, I, I felt the need to still read through it, to have that human angle. I no longer feel that. I've done enough of this using AI to know that I there is no need for me to go through it. One last comment about this is the, there was a study, and this is quite recent, the last week or two, and I posted about it on LinkedIn, so you'll find it on my feed, where they've tested this. They've tested GPT versus human um, coders. In other words, human UX researchers assigning labels to um, text. And they found that it was at least as good, if not better. So there's absolutely no debate about this. We don't have to debate and, it. And you don't have to choose either. So one of the things that we mentioned in the book, right, is let's say you, you go to the top level problems in a reviews data set, then you go down to the next level, and then you go down a level deeper and you get to a problem node, right? So I can say for that problem node, can you give me some examples of, uh, when customers complained about the delivery not being at the right address, right? And then brup, it'll pull off. Uh, so 
I can I can choose whether or not to add flavor and context with the actual customer review data to any part of that taxonomy where I need it, right? So it's not a question of choosing. You you can have your cake and eat it. What I like to do in this um, exercise, and I did it over the weekend with this 10,000 rows of, of data, is play the role of the senior stakeholder. You know, the one who's going to ask you the tough questions when you present your findings. And so I do that with GPT. Um, you know, here's the analysis. Well, what about this? Um, you know, asking those, those same sort of questions and really challenging it. And that was my point earlier about using it as a thought partner. Um, it goes both ways. And there's also a point here about democratizing access to it. Even if one person did manually look through all of this review data, you're then relying on their interpretation of that. And after a while, it's like Chinese whispers. You end up with their opinion rather than the voice of customer. But instead, with the access to this, you can have the voice of customer in the room during your ideation sessions. You can refer back to it constantly. And you're not having to rely on one person to translate that to all of you. It's almost like having the customer in the office when you're doing the ideation. So from that sense, it actually means that much more people have access into that data and can use it when they're coming up with ideas. I think that's look, a really important yeah. point that hasn't been made yet, is the fact that all humans, we all have our biases and you know our filters and our lenses through which we look at data. And, and some of those ideas are even preconceived, even before we look at the data, you know, we, we've got those ideas. And you, know, you have none of that with, um, with a machine. Sorry, Craig. No, it's a it's a very good um, point because we found uh, one of the the first interesting point was that we found that doing this co the core experimentation cycle where we unpack problems, we explore and ideate solutions, we write hypotheses, problem statements, hypotheses, and really get into the guts of experiment design. We found that it was helping people who were less experienced way more right why is that because for a lot of this stuff thinking about how you're going to build an experiment becomes reflexive right you do it day by day and these people don't need help right but the people that need help are the people on the product teams who don't do it day by day and who've been asked to start doing it right but they need some help to work on the logic of the experiments right so one of Iqbal's uh, imaginations was a slack bot which is an experiment buddy that goes through all the JIRA tickets, picks out the ones that have got the faulty critical thinking in some part of the experiment data that's been put into the ticket, right? And then go off and have a conversation with that person about their experiment to tighten it up whilst it's still sitting in the backlog. Now, what could the result of that be? Well, people who with lower skill levels get helped way, way more. So they get leveled up really quickly. People who have advanced skills also get help too, right? So it's a win-win for everybody. And that's one of the things that we've discovered that it actually helps people with less experience more than uh, the advanced people. And that that's a bit of a game changer. And also with uh, getting rid of solution bias, because that is that is a problem that's rife everywhere. Because, uh, you know, even even experienced product owners would go through and they would just think about the solution instead of a problem. And it, and it happens way at the beginning with the user researchers when they give their recommendations. There's a whole bunch of uh, solution bias just baked into the entire process because we're humans. And sort of like having AI just kind of pick apart and just kind of uh, uh, force you to critically think. And this is something I found in the workshop doing that kind of really breaks people out of their solution bias and kind of makes them realize, heck, yeah, I was actually focused on this solution, but actually the real problem is this and that this is the actual core cause of it. And this, this leads to a whole bunch of other sort of potential solutions that I haven't even considered. So, uh, so yeah, that's, a, that's another point. It's, it's a greater diversity of ideas. When we took people down to one of those problem nodes I mentioned earlier on and then walked them through that, it was 
it was really helping them improve their thinking there, but it was also suggesting them to ideas that may not have been brought along to the meeting by people because they thought they were stupid. And one of Iqbal's best questions that they added to that was not just generating some ideas to be considered at that point, you know, just widening it right up, but also saying, give me some crazy ideas. And I thought, there's no way that prompt's going to work. It's going to come up with like, you know, some sort of space lasers or something like that, right? But actually, the the weird thing was is that some of the crazy ideas created conversations with people that then led to some really good ideas. So I think one of them was like, oh, do a TV show. And like everyone was like, oh, that's a really stupid idea. But then someone was like, yeah, but we could do a YouTube channel, right? And send people around like with a videographer to pick up on all the kind of things that are happening every day. That would be kind of cool. And they were like, hmm, yeah. That's... So even crazy ideas, if injected into the meeting, and, you know, people would be afraid to bring those along because they would be afraid of getting laughed at. But AI gives permission for more ideas and more more crazy ideas, greater diversity to be discussed by all the humans in the meeting. Awesome, awesome. So thank you guys. That was that was so much information. I feel like we could really spend the rest of the day having this conversation because I have more questions and more questions and more questions, but I do want to just be um show awareness on the time that we blocked for this conversation. So I do want to go back, Johan, and I know that you've talked about this and we've repeated it throughout, but I do want to go where we started and where we started was how do we get started? So the, the question, and again, I know you'll be repeating some of your, um, some of the things that you've covered in the conversation, but how do you suggest getting this thought partner for someone that hasn't used it before to really get started? Where do we begin? whatever you're busy doing in your day and it could be work related it could be uh, just personal what questions do you have where are your blockers where do you think this is a question i might want to ask somebody if only there was somebody sitting next to me ask an llm ask gpt and you know don't give up after the first response because it's probably going to be lame and it's probably going to be disappointing but then you know follow through and iterate, give it some more information, tell it where it's going wrong, tell it, the, as Iqbal said earlier, the more information you give it, the more you prime it, the better it's going to be. And I'll give you a quick example of um, just the most recent one, I'm presenting a workshop. And so as I'm thinking through this workshop, so I, I share that with GPT, um, here's what I'm doing, here's what the objectives are, this is the way I'm thinking about it, this is where I think it should go, this is kind of my rough thoughts about the agenda, feed it in, see what comes back, and remember the more context I give it, so I may have like a playbook that I upload as part of that, I may have a framework that I like, I may have previous meeting notes, I may have um, feedback from clients from before that I upload, so and, and a standard prompt that I give LLMs, GPT specifically, is this one, well, two standard problems. One is get to the point. Don't be verbose. And number two, don't be friendly because it's programmed not to offend you. And actually, that's not helpful for me because I'm asking you for guidance. I'm asking you to challenge me. I'm asking you to help me improve. So I tell it, don't be friendly. Don't be nice. Drop all of that. Just, you know, what, what what do I need to know? How do you challenge me? Help me improve. Um, it's try it the next time you're stuck, and uh, you know play with it. And if you don't know how to prompt it, you can ask it how to prompt it. Isn't that amazing? Like oh, I don't know how to like ask these things. Well, the strange thing is you can ask it how to ask it stuff, and it will actually give you a really good answer. So you don't even need a manual. Isn't that great? No manual needs to be cracked, right? It'll tell you how to have a conversation with it if you're shy. And don't we'll pay you... the Twitter bro $99 for the prompting course. No, prompt engineering is not a job, right? It's not a career. <laughs> Definitely not. No, but also you can, 
have conversations with people about the tools and the ways that they're using it as well. And that's a human way of getting it as a better thought partner. If you try out a really cool tool to do something, I'm sure there's someone in your network that you know would also like to do it. Message them and say, hey, check this out. And then they'll get back in touch with you and they'll say, I did that with that tool. I mean, me and Johan have had this with white paper research tools. We think this one's good. This one does this a bit better and that one a bit worse. And that's like quite a network building way of using AI tools and having that discussion. And you do find new tools that will do the job better or slightly differently for different use cases. And treat it like it's intelligent, which means basically if you're, if you're meeting somebody new for the first time, it's it's going to take a while for you to understand how to communicate with them. So uh, so treat it like a new friend that you've made and you're trying to cook their, uh, communicate with it. And the, the kind of like the core thing going back to the the initial uh, point of the, all of this is, is just get started with a conversation because that's the way you learn how to communicate with this with this massive intelligence and then get the most out. And you don't need over elaborate prompts. There's a simple instruction in the book, which is think, prompt, check, right? Follow that, right? So you put some thinking in, right? Um, before you write the prompt, the prompt is not the first thing, then you write the prompt and you just give it clear instructions. You don't need to like, oh, I've got this like 32 point prompting framework that I'm using from this professor. You don't need all of that, right? You just need to give it clear instructions, provide useful background information and, it, you know, communicate clearly about what you're asking it to do and what output you would like. And we get it wrong all the time. Like you go, Oh, that isn't quite right. So you have to expect that you will chain and iterate things. Like I'll say, oh, can you summarize that to 300 words? And I think, nah, it's a bit big. Can you make it a little bit shorter, right? Or can you give me 10 ideas for that? No, throw away the first three. They're terrible. The other ones are good. Give me a, a new three for those. So you actually go through a whole process of a chain of thought, right, which is a prompt engineering technique, which is you break it down into chunks, right? And you start doing either iterations or you uh, improve something, try it again, and you gradually get to your goal. Uh, people think, I'll put this prompt in and it's a one shot wonder, right? It will immediately give me the very thing that I want and I'll be disappointed and write a post on LinkedIn whining about it if it doesn't give me exactly what I want. That's not the way to use it. Read the book, dudes. <laughs> I think also Johan touched on using it in small ways and stuff that you already do. And obviously we've been talking this entire session about ways to use it in work, but there are fun ways you can use LLMs as well. You can use it to help plan a holiday. I mean, for me, I used to avoid American recipes because they're in cups and ounces. I'd have to go to Google and put in how many grams is this many cups and stuff. Now I just paste the recipe into GPT and it converts it to metric for me. Ah, brilliant. Now I can use those American recipes without having to convert it. So it's just thinking about little tiny ways that it could help you. They don't all have to be really meta and complex. It's sometimes it's just fun to play with it as well. And I think that's like the key thing that we said at the start as well, just start playing with it. Don't Ru think too much about the prompting mm -hmm. like Greg was just saying. Ruben DeBoer talks about this a lot and uh, some of the stuff he shares about GPT is great, right? He has a lot of fun with it, right? And that's, it, 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 don't think of this as a chore learning. It's like, oh, I've got to learn how to do this GPT thing, right? It is actually a lot of fun, right? I've really enjoyed it and I've learned a lot out of it. And you will too. You just have to get on the skateboard. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. So, any last comments? I, I just want to kind of recap the conversation for our listeners, just checking to see if we have any other closing statements. So thank you all for your insightful contributions to, on today's panel on the AI Playbook for Research CRO and Experimentation. We've navigated through a robust discussion, exploring several pivotal questions that are central to integrating AI into our professional, personal routines and organizational strategies. First, we address the crucial starting points for anyone leveraging AI tools. The consensus highlighted that while previous experience can be beneficial, it is strictly, it is, isn't strictly necessary, which is great to know. Accessibility AI is increasingly democratized, distinguishing these tools from traditional, traditional programming or data science prerequisites, which I appreciate having that insight. This leads into what makes the AI playbook to me distinct from a mere prompting guide. 
It's not just about how to use AI, but how to strategically integrate it into workflows to enhance decision-making and efficiency. So I appreciate that. A poignant moment in our discussion was when each of you shared your penny drop experience, realizing that the transformative potential of AI in your respective fields. These personal anecdotes not only underscore the profound impact of AI, but it also illustrated the diverse applications across different sectors for me. So thank you for really getting into that as well. I believe we are turning some of the skeptics of AI by delving into tactics for encouraging adoption, adoption and convincing management of AI's value. So, you know, like I said, turning those skeptics, right? The key takeaway for me in this moment was demonstrating the tangible benefits, such as improved efficiency, cost reduction, and enhanced capabilities in data analysis and decision-making, which are compelling arguments for investment. So I'm sure everyone listening is probably taking notes just as I was quickly. I think you saw my pen in hand. We also discussed the essential elements that should be included in an organization's AI roadmap. Integration of AI playbooks, your AI playbook, as we concluded, should be both strategic and tailored ensuring alignment with organizational goals and the existing tech landscape. So in wrapping this up, it's clear the journey of integrating AI into our work is ongoing and dynamic. I love that you're learning something every day. What we know today is not going to be as strong as what we know tomorrow. The insights here today provide a solid foundation for any professional or organization, I believe, eager to explore and, ex uh, and really exploit AI capabilities so let's continue to experiment, learn, innovate as we harness this full potential of art artificial intelligence. So thank you again, uh, panelists and att attendees for a stimulating discussion. Um, I, I just can't, can't thank you enough. So I'm, I'll leave it with think, prompt, check because that is the last note I made today is think, prompt, check. And that's what I will take in my AI journey as we continue from this moment forward. But I'm happy to say that this is not the end. As I said before, we can keep the conversation going. We can continue to talk for the rest of the day, but unfortunately we do have to come to a stop, but there is more. So I do want to share what's next. Um, and you guys happy to, to join in and chime in, but I'm really excited. I hear there's a technical demo or technical demo webinars that will be coming up over the next couple of weeks on how to use the playbook. So we've had this beautiful discussion today, but we're going to get really hands-on and be able to offer listeners just ways to really kind of get into the system and use the playback, playbooks. But we do ask that you have a chance, take a read. So when you come to that demo, you're prepared, you're ready to go. The book is available now to download from the landing page. We will also post that on our Convert LinkedIn page, but the book is available now. It's time. Pull it out. Let's get to reading. Craig is also running a workshop, so Craig, thank you for that, on the practical use of AI on the 11th of June at the Experimentation Elite. So if people want to get hands-on, they should also get a ticket. So as said, we are available, we will continue to be available, and thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Get the book, ask us some great questions. Um, we'll be around. Yeah, Hope you enjoy great. it. Thank, thank you, Tiffany. You're welcome. Thanks, Have a Stephanie. Good. Bye. Thanks.